Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Myers, Chief Growth Officer at Deep Crawl. It's great to be back again for our monthly webinar series. And today, again, we have a great topic, a great presenter for you guys to uh, listen to for the next hour or so. Um, really want to expect to get a lot of questions out of it. It's a topic which is very, very pertinent in the marketplace at the moment. And obviously, that is the increasing importance of site speed. And as John Henshaw, who's uh, with us today, has uh, titled it on his deck, You Need It and here's how to get it, which I think is incredibly true. So a big, a big, big thank you to um, another John without an H, as we've been talking, talking about it earlier on, uh, Mr. John Henshaw, who is the senior SEO analyst at CBS Interactive. And for you guys that I'm sure have worked in the space for a little while, is the main man and the founder and president of what was Raven Tools, and still is Raven Tools, but uh, he's often doing new things now. So massive thank you, John, for, um, for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. Great, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. You, I mean, John, for me, is really one of the top authorities on this topic around site speed and uh, has spoken at events all over the world um, you know, about you know, this topic and many other topics within the SEO space in the time that he's been around. Uh, and there is a real need for thinking very, very strongly about speed. I mean, as you recall, we did a webinar for your regular attendees a couple of months back around the, the mobile space and obviously moving towards the mobile index and the importance of mobile. And I think site speed really goes hand in hand with that. And some of the things that John are gonna, John's going to cover today um, are things as SEOs that are on the line or as brand holders and in-house people should really, really take online and really think about what we're going to talk about. Um, I mean, just to throw a few numbers out there, it's amazing to think of some, some Google studies that I recently saw that if it takes longer than five seconds for your site content to start to load, you have over a 100% bounce rate. So you're effectively putting yourself out of business by just having a slow loading website. So I'm absolutely, today's about giving you some tips and tricks as to things that you can do to really, really get that down. And some of the Google benchmark numbers that I've seen out there in the marketplace recently talking about, you know, speed becomes even more interesting when you think about things like, um, you know, actually speed to displaying first piece of content. You know, Google is saying best practices around about three seconds. You know, our fastest response in the sense of actually just making a response to drag stuff back in from a mobile web server is at 1.3 seconds. So there's some really interesting numbers getting thrown out there. And today is all about actually satisfying that part of the process for you and making sure that you get some really meaningful tips and tricks that you can either put into use on your customers or take back into the office and, and use. And I'm sure John's gonna talk to some of those ones as, uh, as those guys um, do at CBS Interactive. So without further ado, um, I want to just basically go through some housekeepings. It is absolutely usual format. Uh, John H is going to present for about 30 minutes. We will then absolutely get into conversation thereafter on Q&A. Um, please, please do submit your questions ongoing. So if you see something that you'd like clarifying, submit it into the chat box that sits within the webinar uh, link that you guys can all see on the side. And, uh, you know, we love a question or two and we'll have plenty of time for that towards the end. And, and also, just to get let you guys know as well, we're going to give you exclusive access to um, a site speed white paper about a week early that we're putting out today. There'll be a download available in the side of the uh, the webinar go to side of uh, the box that you're seeing on your screens today. And also, we'll be obviously recording this whole thing for the next hour, and we'll do our usual follow up email and also put the link in there for that as well. So you get uh, you get the best of all of the worlds. So you get to listen in live, and if you haven't made it and you have registered, you get a full a full recording and uh, access to our exclusive white paper a week early. So I'm going to stop now for about the next 30 minutes and I'm going to hand over to Mr. John Henshaw, who is the Senior SEO Analyst at CBS Interactive, to take us through the uh, the whys and what of uh, the importance of site speed. So over to, over to you, John. Great, thank you. Um, I will wait till I can switch and share my screen. Yeah. And I think we have success. All right. So I really appreciate everybody uh, coming. It looks like we have a great group, actually, of uh, people attending today. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. I am a technical SEO geek through and through. This is the thing I, I love to delve into the most. Uh, and uh, this particular presentation, it won't be going over some of the basic stuff that you may have seen in other presentations about page feed and site speed. Uh, this is going to be things, uh, some things that are new, some things that you should be doing right now that a lot of people aren't doing. And so my hope is that what you get out of this will make your site ultimately more 
competitive and, and perform better um, than your competitors. I mean, that, that's really the goal here is if you could do the things that I'm going to talk about today, um, your site's going to be faster than your competitors. You're going to outperform them in regards to speed. So let's see. So the very first question uh, is, is around why is speed so important? I know there are things that have been said about, well, it's supposed to be a ranking factor now, or it is on mobile or that type of thing. Um, but a lot of it has to do with user experience. Um, and, and that is actually one of the reasons why Google has started to focus on this. And John Myers had mentioned that once you reach a certain uh, amount of time for uh, your page loading, that people will just start bouncing out, that people will essentially just go and, and leave uh, in the idea around search. They'll just go back, you know, click back, go back to their search results and end up clicking on your competitor. So one of the main reasons that you want to have a fast site is so people will actually stay on your site and they won't bounce out. But there's plenty of other great reasons too. Uh, and, and these are all backed with research and that is uh, faster loading sites make more money, particularly of course on an e-commerce site. Uh, as I said before, they provide a better user experience. Uh, they increase people coming back because your site isn't slow and crappy. <laughs> so people will come back and, and it can influence search visibility. So those are also all very good reasons to do that. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions around site speed and, and page speed is, is that uh, they everybody thinks that they need to get their entire page to load immediately. They need to get it to load quickly. Uh, and that is not the case. When we talk about site speed, what we're actually talking about is something called first meaningful paint. And that is the thing that uh, users and Google are uh, most interested in, is most important to them. And what that means is what shows up above the fold. What it means is when I go to that site, what is it that I'm actually seeing and how quickly do I see it? And in this case, what we're really going for is we're looking for uh, the, the content, particularly the, the text, the copy, to show up um, within, I would say, 80% of the viewable area, that's what we're going for. And, and there's this thing called the critical rendering path. And, and the best user experience that we found is, is one that is optimized, that is progressive. And that means that when somebody visits your site, they don't sit there for several seconds with a blank screen and then things start to pop up. Instead, what's been found is that um, the best user experience, especially as it relates to speed, is is one that actually develops in your eye. It seems faster. It has there's something that the user can focus on, and within just a couple seconds, they'll actually have that eight percent that we're going for. And so that's that's what we mean when we say page speed and site speed. That's the goal uh, for our site that we're going to be pretty much hitting on today. There is one other thing which I'm not really going to be uh, talking about, but uh, there's something called time to interactive. And so it's one thing to be able to display the content quickly to the visitor. It's another thing for them to actually be able to do something with it. There's uh, a lot of times people can display the information, but the page can't be interacted with. They can't click on anything yet because there are things still loading. And so uh, this is something that you should also be paying attention to because it might become um, a factor in uh, how Google looks at your site in regards to speed, but we won't be touching that today. So for now, we're gonna be looking at uh, the progressive rendering, which is what we consider to be optimized rendering of your, of your site and the first meaningful paint. And how can we get there? How, what are the ways that you can optimize your site to be able to bring it back down to just a, a handful of seconds to be able to uh, give that uh, content quickly. And so typically when I approach PageSpeed, the, the first two things that I, that I look at and that I recommend everybody looks at is their CSS and their JavaScript. Those are essentially the, the two biggest gotchas typically, especially with JavaScript, that slow down sites that keep them from being able to render quickly. So the, the first one is with, with CSS. And um, in the past, 
uh, maybe a long past because uh, I've been doing it for a long time. It was considered kind of a no-no to do inline CSS and everybody shifted towards doing style sheets um, that were on their own file. So it was like a dot CSS. And so now we've actually moved back to if it's if it's critical for the page to render correctly, for the layout, for the style to look correctly, then we encourage you to actually do it inline. And inline basically means that you're putting it on the actual HTML page. You're not linking out to it so that when the browser actually reads the page, it also reads that CSS immediately because it's right there along with the rest of the content on the page and it can process and render it really fast as opposed to having to go get that CSS asset, wait for it, load it, um, and then apply it to the page. So that's one thing that we want to do. And then for- Hey, John, sorry, it's John. Yeah. Um, your slides don't seem to be moving forward on the screen. So I just wanted to just flag that one to you, mate. Um, okay, what do you see right now? Uh, slide one. I thought you were just doing a bit of an intro, but um, then looking down uh, the slides, I'm guessing you're probably through to about slides 12, 11 or 12. Oh, no, I'm done with presentation. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, so they just weren't moving right, forward for some reason. So, uh, yeah, that's cool. So, some people have probably missed out on some nice graphs there. So, I don't know if you did maybe want to do a quick two minute recap on just slides sure. um, three through, um, through 10. The, the, the content's amazing, but uh, people have missed out on some really cool graphs there. Okay. Let me. Um... Let me stop sharing and, re and restart and see if that kind of fixes it. So, so I'm assuming you can see it now. Yep, all all good. I can see slide three now. Okay. Well, that's that's sad. Okay, um, that you couldn't see it. Um, yeah, so it's probably something you know. Technology is always fun. So this this was the bounce rate um, graph that I was showing you, and all this stuff is going to be online. So if for whatever reason, you can't see what I'm showing you. Um, it's going to be made available. Deepcrawl is going to do a blog post and have a link to the slide share. So, um, and I may just have to kind of stop and go here. I'm not sure why it's not, you know, completely working. Let's see if I can do full screen. There we go. That's working better now. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Let's see. So this is, uh, I went over text. There's nothing really uh, amazing <laughs> that, that you missed. Um, there's a really nice orange knot right here. So I think we could just kind of scoot, scoot through. These are the ones that I did want you to see. And this had to do with the uh, kind of the 80% content goal above the fold that shows up within the first few seconds. That's what we're really going for. And so I did want you to see that. Uh, this is the critical rendering path. Uh, and the top one, the optimized one, which is what we call progressive rendering, is what we're really going for versus the bottom one where you're in that sort of like blank zone for several seconds and then it just kind of pops up. That's the user experience we're trying to get away from. Um, and that was about time to interactive. Um, so where I left off was with CSS. And I was talking about how we want to uh, make sure that we do inline CSS uh, to make sure um, that you have the critical CSS to be able to render the page and you're not waiting on that asset. And so this is right here is where I left off, which was for all the CSS that you, uh, that is not critical for the page to like function for them to be able to uh, be able to see the columns that you might have on your, on your page, to be able to see the text that you want them to read. Then what you want to do is you want to do something called as asyncing. And so, this particular code right here will make your CSS asynchronous, which means that it will load after the fact. It'll load after it loads um, the main page. And, and so you don't lose anything. Um, it just will come a few seconds later and you kind of get that critical rendering above the fold. The next thing that I recommend people do is, and this is probably the biggest one as far as what slows down sites, and that is to figure out the JavaScript that's actually critical for that first meaningful paint and to also make that in line. Now, sometimes you might not be able to do that because perhaps it might be a, a, just a lot of code to um, put on the on the actual page. But for the most part, uh, it shouldn't be. And, and if you are actually depending on a lot of JavaScript, 
to be able to even render that page, then you may want to reconsider um, using that and, and doing something different. So for, for JavaScript, you can also use uh, something called async, which is an attribute um, that can be used within the script. And, and that will essentially make that JavaScript as asynchronous the, for the code that is not critical for rendering. And so you can add something as simple as async into your script and that will make it asynchronous. But like most things with technology, there's a problem with just using that. And uh, the uh, developer advocate, uh, friends with Ben Morse, um, he uh, says that you actually need something beyond that. And the reason why is because it's not dependable. So even though async is a standard, it's something that browsers should support, uh, that it doesn't always work. And it's because the way browsers, including Chrome, are made is they're still trying to load all the JavaScript as much as possible, and sometimes they will ignore that. And so what he recommends is a script called defer.js, and it's written by, by Patrick Sexton, which some people might know. And what it does is it lets you specify the JavaScript that is not critical that you want to load after the page loads. And, and so uh, it's a simple little script. You'll notice on the slides at the bottom, I have the kind of the short URL. And so if you go to coilwolf.io uh, async defer, that will take you to Patrick's site and it has that code right there. And so that is um, what he actually recommends. You can use these things um, in conjunction if you want. Um, uh, if you have a lot of JavaScript, then I, I would definitely not depend on, on simply just the async attribute. I would actually consider using the defer JS script. So uh, same link right there. Um, so the, the thing is, is, is that um, you, with or, I need to, sorry, I just have something in front of my face here. <laughs> um, always, you need to, in general, always put uh, non-critical CSS and J and, and JavaScript after the page content. So even if you don't do async, even if you don't use defer.js, don't put it before your content. It always needs to come after your content. That is just simple best practice. Um, and then as you start to uh, try to refine it even more, then try to add async, try to add defer.js, and then use tools, which I'll mention at the end of this presentation, um, that will help you refine this. So there's one more thing that you can do on top of this. You're probably gonna be good with this, but there's one more thing, and, and the reason why I bring it up is because I'm excited about it. Um, it's fairly new, and it's called Priority Hints. And Chrome in particular, I think Chrome Beta either now supports it or will soon, uh, and, and it supports this Priority Hint, and it's called Importance. And it's a new standard that's trying to be uh, implemented to, in, into different browsers. And what it does is it lets you specify uh, how important it is to the page. And, and so you wouldn't necessarily have to use the other, other methods or it can be used in conjunction with this. And it's as simple as adding importance equals high or importance equals low. And it can be used on, on links, so it can be used with your CSS, it can be used on images, whether or not that's an important image to load or not, used on scripts and can be used with iframes. Um, and, and so the reason why I bring this up is because even I, I'm a big fan of, of trying to see where Google's going and what's going to be important to them and also future proofing my site. Uh, that's one of the things that I think can give you a good competitive advantage is that uh, if you go ahead and use these things and implement them now uh, and the only you know, real thing that can happen is either it's not being used or it is then you're pretty much set up for anything that's going to happen in the future. As soon as anybody starts using it, then it's working. And so this is something I'm going to be personally at, start start adding to my sites, um, which is essentially going through and specifying which assets uh, are of low importance or high importance when it comes to loading my page. And when this starts becoming bigger, my templates are already set. So the 
the next thing I want to talk about, which is another big uh, just time suck in regards to rendering and is related to JavaScript, um, is uh, server-side processing. And a lot of people use A-B testing and they use things like Optimizely. Uh, they might use Google Experiments. But a lot of people also don't know that it really slows down your site. And there was, you know, in the beginning, we thought, you know what, we can offload everything onto the end user. We're going to offload everything onto their browser. Computers are fast enough now, that type of thing. But they aren't. And it slows down the actual experience. And, and so what I recommend people do is that if you're going to be doing A-B testing, that you actually use the server to process it, don't use the browser and stop doing that, which I think for like Optimizely is, is the default. Um, but both services, both of the big services, even though I know there's, there's more than this, uh, do support server-side testing. And so that's the next thing I recommend is uh, to kind of just get rid of that JavaScript that you're putting onto the browser is to actually run that off the server. And so I encourage people to do that. You can get a really big speed boost from that, especially if you do a lot of A-B testing. Web fonts. So web fonts, uh, I'm only going to go over one thing that's kind of newish and really cool, um, but people should know that uh, web fonts can get really big and really slow down um, uh, the ability for people to download and view your site, especially if they're on mobile, uh, especially if they have a slower connection. What has happened is, thanks to Google Fonts and great designers, they have been like, oh, okay, great. So I can use these very web-friendly fonts, but they end up using a lot of them. Um, the more kind of styles that go with a particular font, the bigger that font file becomes. And so in general, you want to try to not use as many as possible. Uh, I actually try to stay away from them altogether, uh, but I know that's, that's kind of impossible. But there is a, a fairly new technique that is being discussed um, that works, that can actually take back that time, that will let you still use the fonts you wanna use, but not slow down the actual rendering of that page or having that weird flash where things go blank and then the, the font comes back on. And that's called font display. And it, it's um, something you can use um, in CSS. And an example of that is font display equals swap. And so what this will do is it will actually load the page and, and display your text immediately, which is what we're really going for here, uh, regardless of whether or not it's been able to download and apply the web font yet. And so Ben, ben Swartz uh, recommends font, defo, font display swap. That's something he's been including in, in his presentations, which I linked to at the bottom here. Um, and then Bastion Grimm actually recommends font display optional. And so, now that I've just told you this, you're probably going, well, you know, which one should I actually use? Uh, and so it depends. Um, and it depends on the situation of which one you want to use. And so swap is is used for when it it must be displayed in order. In other words, um, show the text even without the font. But ultimately, if I want people to experience the site the way it should be experienced or or it applies to the usability of that site, then you would use swap. However, if it's not detrimental to the site, it's not critical to it, then you would use optional. So if it's more of just, it's a nice to have sort of font that kind of adds a little bit of styling to uh, the general copy, to the general text, then you could use optional. And so to me, that would be a blog. It would be something where applying that it doesn't have to happen. And in the perfect world, it, it would be somebody who's on a mobile device. It was a slow connection, and enough time passes that it's like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to actually. The browser would decide it's not going to get that font, and it'll just keep it as is, and it will still be a good user experience. Uh, but that shaves off a ton of time as opposed to having to wait um, for the browser to be able to download that and then display that that uh, text to users. So I'm pretty excited about that one. That's one I haven't had a chance to apply to my own sites yet because it's fairly new. Um, so I encourage you to, to use that. 
images is another thing that I'm sure that many people listening have heard plenty about. There are image optimizing tools um, that you can optimize the size for pings and JPEGs and that type of thing. I'm not going to go over that. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm, I just want to focus actually on the WebP format uh, because the WebP format is awesome. The biggest problem, um, though, is is that it's still not widely supported, which is you know frustrating, but it is what it is. However, there are ways around that. Uh, the one way is to use fallback code. Uh, and so here's an example of, of fallback code that will let you uh, say, I want you to show this WebP, WebP image, but if it ends up being a browser that doesn't support it, then it can fall back to the cat.jpg. So that's one way you can do it. There's also another method where if you're running Apache, you can um, add some code to the HT access file and it can actually do that kind of on the fly. I actually prefer the super easy lazy way. And, and that for me is to use Cloudflare. Um, I'm a really big fan of Cloudflare because they have a free account that will give you um, SSL. Uh, it's like a flexible SSL. Uh, so that alone is really nice. Um, it gives you something else, which I'll talk about in a second here. But one of the really cool features is something called uh, Polish. And what it does is, as you can see with the little check mark, is it will automatically serve WebP images for you. You don't even have to create them on your site. You could actually have just all pings. It will actually convert and serve WebPs for you, and I absolutely love that feature, and it works, um, and that reduces uh, speed. So that is the easy way to use WebP. But the other thing that I really like about Cloudflare is with their SSL, they also support HTTP2. And HTTP2 uh, essentially creates, uh, uh, instead of having to hit every file and asset individually, it does like a multi-stream and it's really fast. And so um, if you have SSL, which is required for HTTP2, um, then you should really consider turning it on. And this is a real life test I did on a slow 3D, 3G connection. And what you're watching right now is a, a HTTP1 connection, which is what most sites are still using, having to pull in a bunch of different image files and assets. And as you can tell, it's excruciatingly long. I mean, it takes forever. I mean, imagine being out there with a slow connection on your phone and we're getting, you know, we're past 30 seconds. And then once this completes, so about 36 seconds, this is HTTP2 and it's, it's stupid fast. So 6.8 seconds versus 35.9 seconds. And so it's kind of a no brainer. And, and uh, this to me is a lot of people will test this on a faster connection. And obviously you're not going to see as much, but when you start looking at mobile devices and slower connections, HTTP2 is a no brainer and it's just some, something that you have to turn on. Um, so I recommend people do that. Again, if you use Cloudflare, it's, already done, it's automatic. So that's why I, use, I like using Cloudflare. Uh, resource hints. So a lot of speed is about the user experience. And it's not always about somebody going to Google, searching for something, clicking on a link and then going and then how fast your page appears. It's speed is also about the experience they have when they're on your site and when they potentially go to that next step. And if it's an e-commerce site or a learning site or something like that, you want that experience to continue to be fast regardless of, of what you're gonna present to them next. And so I really like using resource hints and, and the one in particular that I, th I think is kind of the best is Prefetch. And what's nice about Prefetch is it lets you it s essentially load a particular asset after the fact that you uh, want to be able to serve quickly. And so an example might be um, maybe a checkout process and or, or maybe a uh, some type of online course where the next page has a lot of stuff on it, 
but you want to be able to, when they click on it, for just be there and to, for them to literally jump into it. Or if it's e-commerce, they can um, have this really big script that you use to make the checkout process really nice, um, but it might take a long time uh, for it to load. Well, you can load that in the background before they even go there by using prefetch. And so that's something um, that I like to use for the actual, just once they're on your site, how can you speed up that experience? So best tools, there's, there's plenty of tools out there. Uh, it, it's probably no surprise to anyone that um, the best tools are from the people who are the most focused on this right now and are doing things that affect all of us from an SEO perspective. And so the best tools are really coming out of, uh, from Google. Um, I, I pretty much use Google's tools exclusively when it comes to speed, uh, especially when we start getting into the technical things that I've discussed today. When you're really looking at that first meaningful paint, you're you're looking at that the critical rendering path, which it will show. And so Chrome developer, tool, developer tools, which is just built into the Chrome browser, is, is what I use. And so, for example, uh, not only can you look at things based on device, which I use almost every day for the things that I do, um, that example I gave you with HTTP2, I was able to specify 3G bandwidth. And so you can actually in the Chrome browser, in developer tools, be able to specify a particular mobile phone um, or device, and you can say, I want it to be 3G network, and you can actually see just how fast or slow, and, and for most of us, it's gonna be slow, your site is. And then you can start to use the different techniques that I discussed in this presentation to try to speed up your site, and you just kind of go piece by piece by piece with these tools until you start to see um, this waterfall view, view that I was talking about that starts to shorten and shorten and shorten, and then you get to that perfect place, which is 80% of your main content displays within, say, the first two or three seconds above the fold. That is really what we're going for with PageSpeed. And so here's just an example of the performance view that I would use, and it will show you the waterfall of, of uh, different assets that are loading and what keeps loading in the background and, and what it looks like as it loads. And so it's it's pretty awesome. Um, in general, there is something called rail. And, and these are the four essentially elements that Google has um, come up with for everything that, that webmasters and SEOs need to focus on when it comes to speed. And so if you go to the uh, link below the coywolf.io slash rail, it will take you to the Google site that goes over all of this in depth. And so I encourage everybody um, to, to look and read um, everything they have to say about rail, essentially. Uh, and a lot of the things that we, just, we discussed today will be a part of that, um, but that is probably one of the best resources online um, when it comes to how you should be putting your site together, especially as it relates to site speed. And that is it. Fantastic, John. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks. Great content, great context as always. Um, absolutely back you up on all of that, and I particularly love the bit when we pull out and talk about obviously font display and CSS and stuff like that. Simple little things that just make a massive difference. Um, and so, I mean, I think the rail piece, I absolutely agree with you there. I think that link, um, if everybody gets, gets a copy of this tomorrow, go and explore that link because it's. Um, it's hugely interesting just to see where Google's going with all that and the fact that they're massively preaching responsive um, and everything that's pushing towards their mobile world without a doubt when you, you know, you're looking Webmaster Central now and they're producing versions around site speed and ranking factors for not only desktop anymore but, but mobile as well. So they're actually, you can you can really follow that trend. So brilliant. And you'll be, you'll be pleased to hear, sir, we have a lot of questions. I is, see that. <laughs> which is which is always a good thing as well. So don't get distracted by the questions you can probably see in the chat box. I've I've been picking them as we've been going, and um, I always and, like and to just start. know I'm not afraid to say I don't know. <laughs> that's fine. If you don't know and I don't know, then we're in trouble. But let's find out where yeah, we yeah, go. Yeah, we're, no, we're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> all I know is with your, your loading slide, HTTP two is clearly the way forward for. Uh, oh yeah. Story whole place so you know jump on that one guys for you guys that are on the line today if you haven't got http2 in place it's it's a really easy quick win for sure so i'm gonna i'm gonna hey, go John, start back. There, there is one thing i want to throw out uh, just a, sure. a piece of information and that is um uh, up to today as far as we know 
Googlebot still only crawls with 1.1. And so uh, switching to two is is truly just um, a user experience thing um, for, for the end user. It, it's Googlebot apparently still um, doesn't use two yet. I don't know why I remember asking publicly uh, to, to John Mueller, but he's a busy man and I never heard back or, or it's a secret <laughs> or something. The Google um, thing is, and they're always playing catch up on, yeah. I mean, they're still on Chrome, they're still on Chrome 41. And I mean, Chrome 41 came out in 2015. So, right. They're still, so, they're so still... I just want to throw it out there that, that, you know, there were several things, including like the priority hints that you're doing that now because you're just making your site better now and, and in the future, uh, whether it be for when that's, that becomes more of a standard and or when Google actually starts to support that. 100%. So let's, I'm going to go first question. I'm going to dive in. So we've got quite a few and I'm going to, going to go down and pick some out. So apologies if we don't get to every single question today because we've got around about 15 minutes left now. Um, but I always like to start and give kudos to the person who asked the first question. And the first question came in very, very quick today from Kevin Wiles. Um, and I'm going to be intrigued to get your view on this one, John, but it's uh, what's your guidance on handling sites where 70% of scripts slowing the site come from third party and you have no control over these? Yeah, that, <laughs> that's a great Is that question. Is that basically a situation where you're screwed or? Well, it's funny because, you know, for the longest time, if you were just running uh, Google Analytics <laughs> and, and you went and did the site, the older site speeds, tool it would like even if you did everything correctly it would tell you that there's something wrong with your google analytics script <laughs> and you're like oh yeah. man, i can't win um and, and so the thing with that is it comes down to finding the balance between the that critical component you know in other words what's critical for this page to actually work um and and it may be that you could still keep those scripts but if mm -hmm. you were to if they aren't critical for that first meaningful paint, then I would do all the things I talked about before. I mean, I would async it, I would defer it. Um, I mean, I, I would do anything I could to make it secondary to getting that main page to load. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't do that, then I would, that's where, and I kind of said this too earlier, that's where I would really reconsider using those scripts. I mean, I would, you know, that's where you need to really yeah. look at is there a better way to present this do i actually have to use all these things it gets really complicated for those who are on wordpress which is probably most people on you know for listening in there's like oh you know i use i use 15 plugins and it uses all these libraries well that's yeah. a problem i mean and and you probably need to really consider um uh, finding a, a different solution or being able to shed some of that code yeah i agree probably it's quite nice into a question from anders burla uh, Johansson, who's you know basically asking what is the best way to measure first meaningful paint, uh, both in the development mode for the developer to measure uh, and improve, and also in the case where the site is live and you actually get the first meaningful paint uh, for live users. So, so that is where I mean, it kind of the answer was in the question a little bit, but um, mm. it it's with it's with developer tools with the view that will there there is a view in develop, in developer tools that will actually show you um, the pages being rendered and you can actually see kind of like the example I gave early on where it had sort of the blank page and then a little bit of text and something else something else you know after that um, develop, developer tools will, will give you that they will show you how it renders based on time and and so what you do is you look at that, and you go, oh, I don't even reach, you know, 50% until four seconds. And and then based on that, you go and tweak and then you run it again and refresh it and, and mm -hmm. see how it comes out until you finally get it to where you want it to be. But it's it's a process. I mean, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about today, some of it's easy. I mean, Cloudflare is kind of easy, but the rest of it is um, uh, trial and error. Yeah, no, without a doubt, I totally uh, agree with you on that one. Just, I mean, just thinking about things like Cloudflare and that, there's, um, you know, a non-relevant CSS. Carolyn Leiden just said, you know, what, what is non-critical CSS? You know, well, how would you define that in some respects? If it's non-critical, should it, should it even be there in, in some respects? And then, you know, how do you maintain that, you know, long-term from your experience with, you know, changing sites and, and so on and so on? So I think that's a, I think that's a great question, <laughs> and um, because because 
<laughs> and I'm with that sentiment. Like, well, if it's not, you know, why would you even do it anyways? Um, yeah. uh, it, it typically, there's, you know, there's multiple factors. One is that uh, even something that you may not find to be important might be important to the other stakeholders. And so that becomes critical. <laughs> In other words, yeah. if they're saying this site needs to ultimately look like this and use these fonts and, and that type of thing, then in that sense, it becomes critical to your job. <laughs> um, there, I'm, I, there might be circumstances where um, a particular font is not um, related to necessarily say alphabetical characters, you know, it might actually mm -hmm. be objects or, or symbols of that type of thing. And if they don't, if that doesn't load and you're using that for um, buttons or indicators or, you know, it's just iconography that has to be there for the site to make sense, then that would be critical to me. But aside from that, I think that for most people, um, it's not critical. I think for most people, um, you know, it's, uh, that that's why like I would, I would be using the font display optional most of the time mm -hmm. because I, you know a lot of us are really we focus on content and content marketing and so we just need people to see the headline and read the copy and, and read the copy and, yeah and to me that shouldn't be critical to a font no i agree just i mean just a couple of quickies on that one kind of thing uh, anders burler again he just said is that you know if you want to live with web fonts which is obviously what we're talking about and in some respects i'm mean, also talking about loading in a certain way and making sure we make things quicker what limit would you, you know, advise on to give to designers? You know, two fonts, three fonts, four fonts. Would you, would you yeah, put so a I'm, limit on it? Or just... I'm married to a designer, <laughs> and I, I that know must be fun. there's a lot of push and pull <laughs> on, on what, you know, how much. No offense, I just I know from the experience of SEOs don't make good web designers, and good web designers don't make good SEOs. So right, right. So, so you know, maintain a happy marriage, you find compromise. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I have found that the the best SEO to designer compromise is is to try to uh, keep fonts um, you know that are not like native web fonts down to headlines and things like that. Like and and when you do that, to also keep the styling options of that font to a bare minimum. So for example, with many fonts, especially Google fonts, if you go with a font and you say, I want the bold, the non-bold, the, the thin, the italic versions of those, the, you know, all of that. Um, each individual style um, is, uh, has size attributed to it. So you could take a font and, and, and make it be really big. So what I generally recommend is, you know, okay, let's, let's use this font for this headline, but it's only going to be bold <laughs> like period and that and that that keeps it nice and small and it helps it load a lot yeah. quicker and so that's generally what i recommend fantastic and just bouncing through some we mentioned cloudflare a couple of times so ben o'grady's just asking you know does cloudflare because obviously you've mentioned a couple of times in a very positive way does that interfere with uh with caching uh, we might have already it well it depends on your system i mean like i i mainly use wordpress for everything i do personally and and so you know i use wordpress i use um wp rocket which has uh integration um with with cloudflare and i haven't had any problems um i i have cool. heard of some people having some problems i think in most cases the ones that i've delved into and wanted more details on it ended up being and i mean this in the best way possible ended up being like user error in, in the sense of like it was a configuration issue um in most cases i have not seen weird caching problems i i could definitely see it with a custom CMS that already does its own stuff that is somehow interfering with how Cloudflare works. Right, okay. So I've got I've got quite a few WordPress questions, which is great. You've mentioned WordPress and then suddenly you know how it kind of just explodes into the WordPress world. So I'm just gonna go three three quick ones on the bounce. So I'm gonna start with Adam Levine because he came in first. Do you have any recommendations specifically for WordPress users? If you could pick like a you know, your biggest recommendation, you know, to somebody who's using WordPress, what what would be your go-to area to to think about in the world of site speed? Um, I would say the first place. Well, ooh, there's a lot of places to start. Um, well, there is, yeah. The, <laughs> so I thought let me, I mean, I'll I mean, limit it to one because this could be. I a mean, number, number one is the theme. Number one is the theme. Um, yeah. Most themes, even if they say they're SEO friendly, are still going to be loaded with a bunch of code, and they don't know how to do the things 
um, even close to what we discussed today. So, so most themes won't be put together like that. Uh, and, and so uh, the, the problem with using a, a pre-built theme is if you go in and you do make those changes, well, then you won't get the updates um, when they come out. So that's, that's an issue. So, which is why I personally will, I, I build all my themes from scratch, I, from like a bare bones uh, WordPress theme, just because I think that's, that's the safest way to go and I can control everything. An another one, uh, which is what I was going to talk about before is plugins. Um, plugins is the biggest gotcha. It's a, it's a gotcha, gotcha from a standpoint of stability. Um, and it's a gotcha from, uh, the fact that it creates bloat, uh, it creates code bloat. Uh, the code more bloat. plugins that you put on there, the likelihood of the more JavaScript libraries that it's using and the slower it's, it's going to make your site. So, so it's mm -hmm. number one is kind of like the theme, attack the theme, um, because a, a lot of things can be fixed there. And then number two is, is, uh, be very, very particular in what plugins you use and how many you use. No, I couldn't agree more. It's great to hear you bring up the word code bloat. I mean, it, make, it sounds you make old school like me kind of thing because it's it's something years ago you would have to consider it very, very we're heavily. Old. We are old school. We're well, old. Yeah, we're, I guess we are in some respects, but uh, it's nice to hear that when it gets brought up and things like log files again and stuff, which seem to be making a comeback, which is wonderful to see. Um, so just on the WordPress theme again, it's just uh, Dave Steele's just asking, do you have a preferred image optimizer for, for WordPress? I mean, you talked obviously about optimization of images in the new formats. But would you would you recommend anything in particular for a WordPress? Um, you know, I used I used to use the OO one a lot. There's the Tiny Ping. Um, I mean, a lot of the sort of more well known ones I think are pretty good. Um, I'm uh, I'm weird in that I like to have a lot of control <laughs> over um, just how the code is done, including how the images are done, and so I will actually take the time to just do it myself. And so I, I use, I'm on Mac, and so I use a, a, something called Image Optum, um, which is a free image optimizer, and that's actually what I use. And then now I'm actually using Pixelmator Pro, which mm. within the last several weeks released an amazing save for web functionality. So so amazing that I actually got rid of my Adobe subscription because I don't need it anymore. Um, it's, their save for web functionality is absolutely fantastic. Mm. Um, and and kind of does everything top tip there for sure um so just thinking about things like because again it's it's a big topic things like latency and caching and stuff like that um, melody patula is you know saying that basically they they work with many clients that experience a, a ton of latency due to requests for various tracking codes um any any top tip for minimizing uh, that latency i mean it's it's a difficult problem. Um, I can't really go into it on this call, but I mean, it's something that I experience with the stuff I do day to day. Um, mm. The uh, it's it's basically tracking in ads is is where um, you get slowed down because most of those are are third party, uh, and most of those are important to the business, and yeah. and so. Well. It's revenue, isn't um, it? At the end of the day, through the door, and kind of much as you yeah. say, so, so, so you just do what you can. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, really. I mean, I'm just being realistic here. You do what you can. If there are things that you can host locally, you do that. Um, if there are ways that you can async or defer, you do that. You, you. Um, I, I think a lot of people just kind of throw up their arms, hands, whatever, um, and and you know, say it is what it is. But I would keep testing. Uh, going back to the developer tools and and being able to kind of look at how things um, render, I would keep testing things. I would I would move different scripts in different places and and see if you can find that that perfect you know middle ground where it's both rendering quickly and the the key scripts, the key tracking or app scripts that must um, run uh, are running. And and so if you and after a bunch of testing, you just go with the one that gives you the best performance and and that's the most i guess you can do no perfect and then a quick one from the same sort of vein in some respects from uh on hilario who's asking the question around you know how can caching software help with site speed i mean it's been mentioned a couple of times today how in some respects how that it, you know it, it can help but do you recommend uh, to use you know any particular type of software 
Um, yeah. So I and I and I mentioned one earlier, um, which is so so I'm pretty much a believer in WP Rocket. That's just the one I'm committed to. <laughs> um, I've used them all. Um, like you're saying, I mean, we're old school. We've been doing this for a long time. I've used them all. I've used all the free ones. You know, everything. Um, WP Rocket's the only one that I've used that I haven't had something weird happen or something break. Which you know, when that happens, I immediately lose trust in that particular thing because it's so important. Mm. Um, and WP Rocket is the easiest one I've ever used to set up. I really should include a WP Rocket affiliate link <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> so <wait, what> <laughs> I mean, this, this is all this is all genuine. I mean, as in like, screw the affiliate link. <laughs> like I, this is what I use personally because I I personally find it to be the best solution uh, for caching. And so I use it, and and I'll give you my whole stack in regards to caching, which is um, I use WP Engine for my hosting. I use, and with that, I use WP Rocket and Cloudflare. And the combination of those three make my sites really fast. Fantastic. But, but they're not the only hosting providers and they're not, you know, I mean, I'm just telling you what no, works. It's your, it's your personal view. It's, uh, it's your webinar, sir, and it's your view and you can, uh, you can say what you you feel is the best route to go to that one. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to ask one final question because we need to wrap this one a little bit early today. And Joe O'Neill, you know, just carrying on the vein around tools. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned value in Chrome tools. Uh, how much, uh, you know, would you put into things like PSI and Lighthouse um, in some respects um, in that vein I, as well? I think Lighthouse is amazing. <laughs> Um, I, I didn't include that's because, what you're gonna get. because we don't have it. Well, no, I mean, like we don't, <laughs> we, we don't have time to go over Lighthouse. So I didn't include no, no, it. No, not at all. But, not at all. But Lighthouse is, I mean, the things that it's checking and, and the report it gives, I mean, it's everything you need to be concerned about right now. I mean, like I, to me, I went over developer tools because it's the most practical for the things that were discussed. Um, but Lighthouse and what they're doing with it and the fact that the, that they're putting so many resources towards it and they even just i think released the 3.0 version um that's where everything's going um and and that's what i would do you know there's plenty of things i didn't talk about i didn't talk about the you know pwas i didn't i mean there's a lot of other things that mm -hmm. we had all day <laughs> we, we, we could go through but but to me the things i discussed today although they might seem kind of technical are very are are uh, their list of of the most practical things that you can do to have dramatic speed increases and if you were to focus on just the things we went over today you're going to be in a really good place and then if yeah. you want to take your site even further then you could do some of those other tools and focus on that fantastic thank you sir well, we're out of time so just a, a few final piece, bits and pieces i mean i haven't been able to ask all of the questions i'm sat here staring at the screen with an incredible amount of questions uh, in here what we'll do is we'll wrap those all up as we normally do and we'll put any ones that we didn't get a chance to get around to we'll get some answers together and we'll put them into the follow-up blog posts um to make sure that you guys that you know put your hand up and ask the question do get uh, do get your answers um also there is you know there is a survey which when you guys log off today there's a little survey that will pop up it's incredibly quick to fill in we would really really appreciate your feedback as we always do every time we do one of these we want to get better at this give us some views give us some thoughts maybe suggest some topics maybe some speakers like you'd like to hear because we're we're on a roll with this now and we're getting some good people on it's great to have people that are coming back and attending on a regular basis as i did mention at the start you know this has been recorded um tomorrow we will you know email it around to everybody that has signed up for uh, for the event uh, so you'll have the recording you will get the slides as well which we'll share with yourself and remember as well as part of that email you will get exclusive access a week early to our site speed uh, white paper and if you can't wait till tomorrow if you do look in, in the chat window now as well um, as of um, about 20 minutes ago we listed a url there where you can go and download the white paper as well so do grab it from the webinar now and get a, get a, a day's head start on everybody else on that one so again just for me i just want to say a big big thank you to uh, mr john henshaw for uh, taking the time out of his busy schedule to talk us through some amazing tips on site speed thank you john yeah thanks for having me and thank you to all of you guys that attended again great attendance and attendees and as i say more questions that we could cope with in the 20 to 25 minutes of q a that we had um, a big, big thank you for me. My name is John Myers, Chief Growth Officer at Deep Crawl. This has been uh, the absolute import, increased importance of site speed. Uh, thank you for, again for attending uh, our Deep Crawl webinar, and we look forward to having you on the next one in around about a month's time. Thank you, everybody.